Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining the quarterly RC West Oversight Committee meeting. This is Christina Osborne, and with ISO Stakeholder Affairs, I'm going to be facilitating the meeting today. Um, just to let the members know, um, you are on the speaker line, which means your phone lines are open. So if you're not planning to speak, please manually mute your phone so we don't um, get any background noise. And uh, uh, Michelle Cathcart is on the line. Christy, are you on the line as well? Uh, but my understanding is Christy will be joining us. Um, she's, uh, so Michelle is going to actually do the roll call in just a minute. So this is the agenda for the uh, public session. After Michelle takes roll, then we are going to have a discussion with the committee members on the Oversight Committee uh, Chair and Vice Chair nominations for the May election. Um, and then Trisha Johnstone is here. She's actually going to be providing the um, operations updates, which is, includes the upcoming, there's some upcoming working groups and oversight committee meetings for 2020. Um, she's also going to provide an update on just uh, regular op operations and the, also procedures. And then she'll talk about the 2020 system restoration training that's coming up. Um, and then Michael Martin is here. He's going to provide an overview of the RC metrics, which we started tracking at the beginning of this year. Um, Ankit Mishra is here also. Uh, he's going to provide the technology update. He's going to actually talk about the full uh, net model accuracy. And Mike Turner will also be here to talk about the schedule. Um, and then we'll go over the future agenda items and then allow time at the end of the meeting for public comment. Um, we are recording the meeting today. We will make that recording available out on the ARCS web, web page. You can find that by going to the ISO public website, um, select the Stay Informed tab. You'll see RC West uh, linked on that dropdown. Um, and there you'll find all the materials for the um, RC West Oversight Committee meetings. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle. All right. Thanks, Christina. Um, so uh, first I wanted to also give a reminder, I think that uh, Christina mentioned it, but if you are an OC member, you should be on the speaker line um, and not using the uh, callback function from the, the webinar. Uh, so that information was from ISORC this morning um, to dial into that number. Um, I also wanted to note that we do have a new uh, RC customer. Uh, Lone Star is becoming a new RC customer on February 29th, and so they have been invited to join us today. Uh, they are a TOP within the Cal ISO Balancing Authority. <clears throat> uh, so, so with that, I'll go ahead and go through the um, the attendance. Uh, so do we have Arizona Electric Power Co-op? Avista. Hi, Michelle. Mike Magruder. Hey, Mike. Uh, and Alvin Grid. APS. Juana Blair is here. Thanks, Juana. Uh, Bank. Jim Shatler's on. Thanks, Jim. Uh, for Bonneville, I'm here. Uh, Cal ISO BA? Yeah, uh, Michelle, John Phipps is here. Thanks, John. Sanase? Chelan? Douglas? Grant? Yes, Leroy Patterson is on. Thanks, Leroy. You're welcome. Grid Force? Uh, Hetechi? Hetechi is on. Thank you. Uh, Idaho Power? Kathy Anderson. Thanks, Kathy. <clears throat> IID? That's all for the IID. Thank you. Lone Star, LAUWP, Los Alamos, MID, Montana, Alberta, Thailand, 
Matt Renner. Hey, Michelle. Jeff Rayfeld and uh, Paul Wilson are on. Thanks, Jeff and Paul. Uh, Northwestern. Casey Johnson, Michelle. Thanks, Casey. And the energy. Pacific Corps. Uh, Eric Brookhouse is on, Michelle. Thanks, Eric. Pacific Gas and Electric. Tom French is on. Tom. Uh, Portland General. Bob Frost uh, and Corey McAllister are both on. Thank you. Uh, Public Service New Mexico. Puget. Uh, Evan Thrill on, Michelle. Thanks, Evan. SRP. Uh, Matt Ledone, Colorado Project. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Southern California Edison. Yeah, Tony Edison's on the line. Thanks, Tony. San Diego Gas and Electric. Seattle City Light. Silicon Valley. Smud. Nahomish. Tacoma. John Nuremberg is on, Michelle. Thanks, John. Trans Bay. Tri State. Hi, Michelle. Keith Carmen. Thanks, Keith. Turlock. Valley Electric. Wapa. Rebecca Dawson. Thanks, Rebecca. Michelle, Ben Brandt, Final Power. Thanks, Ben. Michelle Gabriel Santillan with Senate. Thanks, Gabriel. And Kit uh, Blair is on from Avant Grid, Michelle. Hello. Yeah. All right. Christy Coco from APS is on as well. Thanks, Christy. All right, so we do have a quorum. All right. Uh, so the first topic that we have on our agenda is uh, the RC West Oversight Committee Chair and Vice Chair nominations. So you'll recall that our um, our term uh, agreement was that uh, we would have elections in May um, and that a that two year terms would begin in June. Um, and uh, Christy had just been elected to the vice chair position, um, uh, but uh, we we've learned that uh, Christy is taking on a new position at APS, and so she's no longer going to be able to um, uh, continue with that role with the RC West Oversight Committee. So. Well, we are happy for Christy in her new role. Uh, we will need to be looking for both a chair and a vice chair <coughs> as we move forward. Um, <clears throat> and recall that we had talked about uh, wanting to have geographical diversity uh, between the chair and vice chair. I know that the other conversation that we had had uh, back when Steve retired and, and we brought Christy on board was that, that we had the idea that we would be able to have some uh, a little bit more transition by having Christy be the vice chair for um, a couple of meetings before we uh, went to the chair and vice chair um, elections in the next in, in the May meeting. Um, since we are looking now at having a new chair and vice chair both, um, you know I, I will offer that 
whoever gets elected for those roles, I'm happy to uh, work with them uh, on that transition as we move into uh, the new leadership. Um, <clears throat> but uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I would like to open up discussion and see if there is anybody that is interested in um, nominating themselves or others for the chair and vice chair positions. Then I'll jump up at once. <laughs> All right, well, we will, um, I think what we'll probably need to do is we'll put out an email uh, also. I know that some of you may need to think about this and um, see about getting your management support for being able to throw your name um, into the nomination. Uh, but I do ask that all of you think uh, about these positions, I think, so it's important to keep the oversight committee going um, and uh, have have a strong leadership from the members. Um, I'll, we'll probably also be doing some outreach uh, to a few of you to see uh, those of you that have been more uh, involved and see if there's interest there. Um, and certainly if anybody has any questions about uh, the, the commitment and then um, I'm happy to talk with you about that as well. Are there any questions or anything about that for now? All right, well, I guess we can move on then. And like I say, we'll, um, we'll have some further outreach uh, to the oversight committee members and, and make sure that we can find somebody that will, that's willing to take this on as we go forward. <clears throat> uh, with that, I guess we can move on to the RC operations update with Tricia. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, so uh, for the first part of the operations update today, um, I wanted to um, talk about the upcoming uh, working group and oversight committee meetings. The ones highlighted in red are uh, the next meetings up. So I think um, at the end of last year, we had talked about, you know, trying to set the calendar out far in advance so everyone would be able to plan. We've also um, touched on the subject with the various working groups about whether um, there'd be an interest in having in-person meetings or not. Um, at this stage, these are all planned as webinar meetings, um, but there was interest expressed with the training working group in particular that um, at the tail end of the year, that Q4 meeting could become an in-person meeting. Um, so we're, we're working on that a little bit because that's also um, veterans holiday in the middle of that week. Um, but we will um, also probably start looking at our 2021 calendar as well, just to give everybody plenty of time to plan and work with our corporate calendar and things like that with other meetings. Um, I'm subbing in for Tim today on the RC operations update. Um, so uh, he, he wanted to report that we've been having um, overall mild weather conditions. Um, our, our winter peak, our sea load was 87,898 and that was in December. Um, Previously, by contrast, let's say um, earlier this week on Monday, the load was 78,303. So um, it, it has been very, very mild overall. Um, we have um, been actively looking at the Oregon export eye roll and um, mitigating um, in the margin, um, largely due to spring runoff, um, but we have not um, gotten into or close to the limit. Um, so there's been a lot of coordination and communication um, mitigating in, in the margin there, but not gotten into the limit. Um, at the last real-time working group meeting, um, we presented the annual procedure review schedule um, to try to pace out the reviews throughout the year so they wouldn't come all at once and everyone could kind of anticipate 
you know, which would, would come up for review in which periods of time. Um, the plan right now um, is to you know, do any internal edits if, if we believe internal edits need to be done, and then um, post them for a comment period. If there are no comments, then we'll proceed with making the changes. If there are comments, then we'll determine if webinars and second comment periods are needed. Um, one of the items that um, we actually have made a procedure change on that I'll talk about in our um, procedure update coming up here is uh, related to the Pacific Northwest Conference Hall. We had received feedback from the Northwestern entities about the daily call not providing a tremendous amount of value. Um, and so the procedure um, that, that talks about the daily outage review has been updated to turn that call into a when conditions necessitate. So if there has been something in the OPA um, or forced outages or IRL conditions or something that are really a change from what the plan was in the OPA, then on an as-needed basis, then the RC will schedule that call. Um, the Southwest daily call will still continue to occur, um, largely because it was an item identified as part of the Pacific Southwest um, mitigation, but we'll continue to monitor that and, and make sure that that still provides value. Um, and then the last piece here, um, we have formed a task force um, for the wide area view uh, situational awareness. Um, we are seeking volunteers for this. I think currently we've only had one name submitted, so we would really like um, names to be submitted for this. Um, we're expecting it to run for up to eight months, um, probably maximum. It, it might be shorter than that. But we're looking at the, the Pi Vision tool and the displays that we've made available there. Um, the original uh, set of displays that we put out with the RC West Go Live were kind of our, our best effort to kind of say, hey, these are the ones our operators are using, we'll make these available and we'll see if these are useful and get feedback. We've since received feedback about what people would like to see and it'll, it'll take a little bit of an effort and we'd like to get additional input to make sure that when we know um, that it, it meets the greater needs. So um, if that's something your organization would like to be involved with, please um, you know, send into the ISORC at kaiso.com and, and let us know. Um, who you'd like to have on that group. So for the, and I guess before I go into the procedure and guide updates, I, um, are there any questions from the steering committee? Patricia? Yeah, go ahead. What was the email address again, if we were interested in being on that uh, display? The, the, the ISORC at kaiso.com. All right, thank you. So for the operating procedure and guide update, um, what, what I tried to do is kind of summarize here. So if the high-level description indicates a minor update, it was a logo change, potentially just changing out where it said Kaiso RC, changing it to RC West, or there were minor grammatical updates. So those were done, and if um, the working group was notified, like largely a lot of them were involved, real-time working group, it was discussed at the, at the call that you know, these, these were changes that had come out. The ones that indicate major changes or they were minor that were a little bit more substantive, um, we, we provided a little bit more in the description. So, for example, on the RC 120, 120A for the IRO 10 specification, we went through three comment periods in November and December in anticipation of the peak wind down and also in an effort to align the data exchange or the uh, data request with the um, modeling um, submission templates and, and the modeling guidance documents. We, we did some cleanup and some combining. Um, there were some proposed changes we got feedback on that we decided not to proceed with. So it, it was actually a really good effort, a lot of good participation from the data exchange working group. Um, 
For outage review and coordination, that was the one I'd mentioned previously where the, the change really was to um, modify that daily Pacific Northwest call to become an as needed. Um, on the event reporting, um, minor changes on uh, the Watts Control Center, minor you know, annual review. The WIC schedule change process, um, this was actually a process that went into effect in November and was discussed with the WIC working group. Um, and we, we finally got it converted over into the procedure template and posted in December. And then uh, the last two here on the um, RCO 600 and 600A, those were new um, for the West regional variants that went into effect on January 1st. So this was something that was coordinated through the RC to RC forum to agree to a uh, common RC modeling and monitoring methodology. Um, there were no process changes that came out as a result of that. Um, it's, it's a higher level document than uh, the remainder of our procedures and it's consistent with our SOL methodology and um, the, the other um, uh, practices that were already in place. And then in terms of operating guide updates, um, we had a minor update on the Northwest uh, Washington area IROL. Um, BC Hydro was already in there um, and we added BCRC. Um, there's a new PAP 14 operating guide, um, minor update uh, for the Northern Nevada, a new procedure for Olinda 500, and uh, minor updates for the El Paso procedure. And these all um, involve the operational affected parties um, and in some cases were also discussed with the real-time working group. Are there any questions about the procedure and guide updates? Okay, so for the 2020 system restoration drills, um, the invitations have been sent out by geographic area. Um, so really just for your awareness, um, the area A and C, or excuse me, the B and C drills are starting in April and running for six weeks um, through May. The Area A drill, which is the Northwest area, will start in June and run through July. And the main reason for that adjustment was so we didn't have conflicts with some of the existing training um, for some of the large entities that we really needed in the Northwest area. Um, so what that really brought to light for us is the importance of actually looking ahead at the 2021 calendar now. Um, we, we had a discussion with SPP in BC and Alberta about that, that we want to get out ahead um, as much as possible to try and, and get these dates on everybody's calendars early and then hopefully other training can be planned around those accordingly because it's, we know how important it is for you to have your key neighbors um, participating in those drills. Um, the requirement, we've received a lot of questions about this, is the COPs just need to participate in at least two of the six of the drills offered. So um, we're, we're offering it for your region for six weeks. If you have operators to send for all six weeks, that's fantastic but at a minimum, um, you need to participate for at least two. Um, there are train the trainer sessions prior to these starting to make sure that the access for um, the BRIC works. And um, we're also coordinating invitations with the adjacent RCs. So BC and Alberta for the Northwest area and SPP and the TOPs in their area. So the earlier we know kind of which dates your teams are planning to participate, the easier it is for us to coordinate those invitations because if somebody's not going to be there, then our trainers or our operators may need to step in and, and play the role of the entities who aren't there. Um, in terms of the generator operator restoration exercises, um, our initial invitations went out based on the invitations that Peak had originally issued. And we're, we've gone back and we're actually doing some additional tuning um, based on the roles that the GOPs are actually playing in the plan. So um, we're, we've received inquiries about whether the GOPs need to be at the drills or whether they need to go to this um, special exercise that we've set up. We did them last year. The GOPs have the option to go to one or the other in order to meet their compliance. 
However, if they attend the area drill, it's really important that their transmission operator is also in attendance. The RC does not have a direct relationship with that generator operator, and we'd be looking for the transmission operator to communicate those actions and, and things during that drill. Um, so if the GOPs want to attend, we're asking them, hey, coordinate with your TOP before you pick a date. Um, the GOP exercise dates are more instructor-led webinars, and what we talk about in those is what's the role of the GOP under the system restoration conditions for various um, you know, islanding and partial blackout or total blackout conditions. And the sessions we had last year, um, we got a pretty good response from the trainers. We're making some minor updates for this year, but we, we thought it was really helpful discussion about, you know, are the GOPs really, really aware of what their role is in their TOP plan? Are there any questions about the restoration training? Okay. okay. Thanks, Tricia. Um, so uh, this is Michael Martin. I'm going to give an update on the RC metric development. The RC metrics uh, measure our RC services. They're similar to what PEAK provided. Uh, some of the metrics measure what our participants, uh, BA, COP, what they uh, uh, provide to us. Metrics also measure the RC operator, the OE, the IT professional. They're designed to be reflective, and most importantly, this year, 2020, is a year of baselining. Um, so I'm going to just jump right into these. Um, here's an example of one of them. It's a measurement on our residual error in our state estimator program. Now note that residual flow is a measurement of the uh, calculated flow on a number of lines compared to the actual telemetry values. So what we've done is stacked them up all for January, uh, separated them by uh, RC uh, participant, and shown, shows the relative amount. So imagine each month you'll see another stack bar and hopefully uh, we'll see trends and patterns, in this case, residual error going down. This next one's a measurement of our DACA tool. That stands for our Day Ahead Contingency Analysis Program. This program, what it does is it endeavors to predict uh, contingencies or overloads or things that might happen in the next day based upon outages and system conditions. And what we do is we compare it against our real-time contingency analysis tool, RTCA, and see how, how well it did. So the green, the 35% shows that 35% of the events were identified in a day ahead uh, fashion. They played out in RTCA. The blue side here, 51% occurred in RTCA, but we're not seeing in our DACA program. However, we should note that what we're measuring is we're measuring every single five-minute RTCA run against one snapshot hour. So as this, like the other one, it's a January snapshot stack bar, we hope to see the green bar get larger and the blue one get smaller. This next metric, it measures how many times our contingencies inside our RTCA program do not converge or diverge, don't solve. Now, it could be for a number of different reasons. The modeling's not correct, uh, an outage isn't correct. But in, in this measurement, we note that we're running in every single RTCA run over 84,000 contingencies, and through January, we average every run nine <coughs> non-converged contingencies. So this is another metric. As each month goes by, we hope to see this one go down. 8,400, 8, correct. I'm sorry, 8,400. 8, okay. And I'm moving on to the next one. This, this one here is a metric on RTCA, the solution success success of it or its convergence as a whole. And what we've done is measured this like 
an application where we count the number of five-minute intervals. Each day has 288 times in January, 31 days, and multiply uh, or divide the number of failures. You could reverse engineer this, but for the month of January, it's 99.973%. We hope to see this metric increase as the months go on. We also said in our work group that we would provide detail of any outages to RTCA or state estimate or HANA over 30 minutes, and we did have one in January from 3.05 to 4.10. In the actual metric reports, we'll go into more detail, root cause of what occurred. So that's all we have for the RTCA yes. update. Yes, so any uh, questions from, from the members? So this is John Nuremberg, Tacoma Power. Um, not, a, not something I'm very strong at, but I think there's a question about where our tolerances are set on the state estimation as, as we can get it to converge with broad tolerances, but um, wondering if we should track um, being able to then uh, tighten up those tolerances as our model gets better. Um, that'll give us more realistic results and, and help us identify where we can improve? Sure, hi, this is Ankit Mishra. I'm Senior Ankit. Advisor at the EMS Information Technology. I work directly on the state estimator application. Our, our tolerances in the state estimator are set to 0 0.01, which is the industry standard tolerance. The unit is going to be difficult to explain on this call, but this is the same tolerance that other ISOs and RTOs are using uh, using Siemens application. And I can share with you more details on the application and the tolerances. We have not had, this This is the same tolerance level that Kaiso was using for its internal BA state estimation before the expansion of the network model. And we have continued to use the same tolerance level without increasing it at all as the network model has expanded. Thank you, thank you for the clarification. Sure. Hey, and kid, this is John Phipps. Hi, John. Hey, do you happen to know what peak RC's uh, tolerance band was, just for comparison? I do not know that. I should be able to find that out knowing some other people from peak uh, and, and where they are at this time. I will take that as an action item and report it back to you. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Michael or for Tricia? Technology update. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mike Turner, Senior Manager of Model and Contract Implementation. What you see on the slide here is a table that reflects the 2020 full network model schedule that we posted approximately two weeks ago. Um, over the course of the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, we've worked with a, all of the business units that are involved in this process, took a close look at uh, our processes in that regard and the timing for them. And what we've landed on for the 2020 year is a model cycle that is approximately every five weeks. What we also recognize is that there are the, the weeks that have holidays in them uh, are not truly a full week for us to be able to uh, either build or test the model. So we uh, skipped those weeks or took them into account. So you will see some differences that are more than five weeks in the production deployment timeframes. The reference to week of so, for example, the 20-month-3 model on the top line there, it says week of March 16th, is that that is the week we are targeting to deploy it. Until we get closer and further through the actual build and testing process, we don't know exactly which day we will be ready to put that model into production. But what we have committed is to provide an advance notice to participants so that they do know the exact date, approximately a week before the actual production deployment date. Our model build and testing cycle is roughly a month each. 
So what you'll see for the ISO publishing final scope is a, a time frame that is about eight weeks before the production deployment target. And the idea there is that we should at that time know exactly which projects we have all the right information for in order to do to begin the build process. The customer model document submission deadline is roughly three weeks before that. So if you look at the 20 month eight model, June 12th, we expect to publish the final scope. The deadline for submitting documentation for us to model would be May 22nd. During that time frame, we'll be looking at that documentation and confirming that everything in there is correct, makes sense. There may be some things we can identify that uh, may be an error. We will certainly reach out to entities as we can to try to get correct information. If it's a minor issue, it might be something that we can include in that same scope. If it's something major, then it may be something that the entity will have to uh, provide us a correction that we can then deploy into the following model. The last column there, the very first one actually, is the F and M label, and that's really how we will be referring to the models uh, in terms of people's understanding of which model they're trying to get into. Are there any questions? Yeah, this is Eric Brookhouse with Pacific Corp. Um, with this latest round of changes, it seems it appears that we are going to have some contractual interconnection issues uh, based on some potential movement into that 7-6, which had been planned earlier. Um, we need to somehow understand we have some assurance that we could we can get those in so we can meet our contractual obligations because this last minute change is not allowing us to do that at this point. We've been in communication with Salmon there. Yep. And yep. I understand that a scope of what those items will be is going to be submitted into RIMS for us, as well as a cut of uh, the, mo the SIM model there that you provide us that will include those. So if those are provided, we should be able to get those into that model. Um, and it's something that we're actually trying to look at our schedule right now to see if we can take um, any other SIM uh, cut after that if we identify any issues in this, what uh, Sam Mann has referred to as an emergency cut that will be supplied by the 28th. Okay, thank you. Welcome, thank you for the question. Any other questions on the schedule? Okay, Sure. This is Ankit Mishra again. So this next slide, it talks about the full network model accuracy. This slide is a good culmination for the previous content that has been presented in this presentation so far. Uh, Mike Martin was talking about the various metrics that we are collecting on the quality of solution. And then this also ties back into the frequency and the work that we are doing in improving the network model. The idea is that we have a focused effort going on in improving the solution quality for all applications, including our real-time state estimator contingency analysis applications, as well as the look-ahead reliability application, which Mike had mentioned earlier, DACA application is the day-ahead contingency analysis. For the accuracy of results in these applications, we rely on the data that is provided to us from entities. This data falls into various categories. It could be the network model data, which could be the default switch positions, the way we model the transformers, or it could be the ICCP data, which is driving the real-time solution. We are finding issues in the data that we are currently mapping to our systems. This manifests in various forms. It is manifesting as some of the mismatches that we are seeing between the real-time contingency analysis and the day-ahead contingency analysis, as well as it manifests in the form of issues that our customers, you, are seeing and reporting to us in 
city tickets on HANA application and the violations that the applications are presenting. So the focused effort going on includes reaching out to the customers. We have several communications go out uh, individually to different customers. Our operations team, DD, is also helping us in reaching out to the customers and getting additional information on the model and ICCP. All this data is being funneled into our monthly network models in improving the solution quality. The monthly network model process is allowing us to expedite the fixes that we are getting from the entities and helping us to make the progress in the solution quality faster compared to our previous quarterly network model cycles. That's the update on the full network model accuracy and the work we are doing in that domain. Any questions? Yeah, hey, this is uh, Evan at Puget, and uh, we could take this offline if you guys would like, but uh, one of the questions that we've developed internally, and I don't think that, and we have been working through city tickets with you guys, but I'm, I'm not sure we've got a good answer on this yet. And uh, what we appear to have seen is on one of our units, uh, some telemetry dropped out, which we don't believe was on our side. We think that we were good with that. And as a result, the state estimator felt that one of, it was a, this particular unit is a three by one, felt that one of the units was offline. And so then we received a dispatch uh, through the EIM market uh, that took us off of schedule. So we got settled on. So what we wanted to understand is the difference between the RC state estimator and what's going on with the EIM dispatch. And also, like I said, the troubleshooting effort hasn't worked too good from our side. So like I said, we can take this offline, but I'd like to explore it a little further at some point. Sure. I'll try to answer the question in brief, but it expands different domains. It expands the market domain and the reliability domain. The network model that we use at Kaiso slash RC West for the reliability and the market applications is the same one network model. The same network model is being used for both applications. Some of the data which is critical to both reliability and the market applications is the same data set being communicated to us over the same ICCP link and the same ICCP object ID. When at KISO systems and KISO EMS, we see any kind of an issue in the ICCP data that we are receiving, uh, it may be at the sending entity's end, the issue may be at the sending entity's end or at the receiving end, which is KISO slash RC West end. It may have trickling downstream effects. Not knowing the specifics of the issue, mm -hmm. I will take an action item to investigate more. If you have the city ticket number with you, I, I will take it at this time or I will work with you offline to get more information. Uh, I don't have it with me right now, but we can certainly get it to you, and I, I sure would appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely, yes. I can act as a point of contact on that ticket and follow it through. Okay, and this is uh, Evan Sorrell with uh, Puget Sound Energy. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? Michelle, did you want to add anything? I uh, no, appreciate the update um, on the, uh, and I think that the uh, <clears throat> the next topic is future agenda items. Um, so, I, uh, other than these same types of uh, reports that we got today, are there any topics that folks want to hear at the public session on May 12th? All right, hearing none, then I think we can move to public comment. So I, I think, uh, yes, Lauren, we'll go ahead and um, open it up for questions for the public. So if you do have a question, you can press pound two to raise your hand. And Lauren, let me know if anybody enters the queue, please. So far, I'm not seeing anyone in the queue. We'll give you a few more seconds. So, Michelle, I guess we have the three um, items for the next meeting, then we'll have the elections, and then we'll have the regular technology and operations updates, correct? Correct. Okay. 
And I still do not see any callers in queue at this time. All right. Um, well, I think then that's it for the public session. I did take down just a couple of action items, uh, both for Ankit. <laughs> he would report back on um, the tolerances that Peak used, um, as well as following up on the uh, specific issues that were raised during the, the technology discussion. Yes, Michelle. I got them. Thank you. Okay. So what um, All right. exact members go ahead and, or um, excuse me, committee members can go ahead and stay on the phone. I did send a separate link for the executive session. I sent that by email this morning from RC West, and I also have it in the calendar invitation. So um, Lauren, you can go ahead and disconnect the public portion of this call, as well as turn off the recording, please.